Hi, I'm Ted Haftegaber, founder and producer of Live Talks Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. Since we started over a decade ago, we have brought you hundreds of conversations with storytellers, writers, actors, musicians, humorists, chefs, and thought leaders in business and science. You can watch and hear most of these in our YouTube channel and our podcast. For details, visit livetalksla.org. And now, Here's the show you've tuned in to see. Oh my God. I just want to say thank you all for coming. This feels like a dream. It's so surreal, and I I can't, actually can't see you guys because the light is so bright. But I can hear you, and I love you. Thank you. It's um it's so amazing. This is like a dream come true for me. I feel like I'm in a total dream. Um, before I we know, when I followed her on Instagram, I saw that she had messaged me in 2019, like, "Hey, you're really cool. Let's hang out." And I was like, "You manifested this." I did. Okay, I have to do some pronoun connections corrections though, because everybody's shaming me, so my pronouns are. Oh my god! It's okay. Right. No, it's it's happening and happening, but not a oh woman. Oh my god! I'm an yes. in between person, but it's all fine. I love that. Um, yes, not a man, not a lady, a baby. Mm -hmm. um, my pronouns are foxy. <laughs> <laughs> like foxy is non-gendered. You're foxy. Yeah. Um, you are amazing. I just want to say, basically, what we're going to do right now is pretend that we're meeting for drinks. Yes. Because that's the it's best kind of hard, book talk. So I'm do my I just want to like ask a million questions. <laughs> um, what the hell you like popped out of nowhere? An icon. Uh, a muse who suddenly became, went from being an object to a subject in like two years, Aww. writing an amazing book, like reinventing autofiction. You dove into pop culture like a high diver, and I watched you dive off, and I just like consumed everything you were writing and everything that was happening on your podcast, and I just became obsessed. Aww. So I just want to congratulate you and give you a hand one more time for just like, you're a hero. <laughs> You are an American hero. Thank you. Tell us about the movement from muse to author. I mean, I guess, like, this book, what it really means to me is, like, my chance at, like, correcting a narrative. Because I feel like when I kind of became, like, really, like, out there overnight, there was just so many like preconceived notions and a lot of narratives being pushed on me. And I just felt like they just so were not who I was. And I just felt mm. really like out of control. And I think I kind of turned inward and I just like really went into my own little bubble and I had to protect like the only little bits of me that I had left because I had just gone through like so much loss and and then it's like, I'm just getting all this attention, but it felt like it was like happening to somebody else. It didn't even feel like it was happening to me in a weird way. So I feel like this book is kind of just like me reclaiming my, my story and my identity. Cause it's, cause sometimes when you're being told something over and over, you, you start to be like, well, are they right? Like, am I like this? You know? And, and I guess writing this book and, and the reaction that I've gotten has kind of just reaffirmed like, who I am, you know, I'm, I'm not who these people think I am mm. in, in a way. So that's been really cool. Yeah. It <sighs> felt like being like on a trip with you, like that I was in a car with you and we were just like swerving through your life. And sometimes it was horrifyingly sad and then immediately funny, mm -hmm. you know? And well, I feel like humor is the only way to cope with tragedy. Yeah. You know? Like I've, I can laugh at like the, like even when I remember like when I 
ran away and, and, I, and my dad made all these like missing posters for me and it had like the wrong birth year <laughs> actually by two years off he had me down as five nine like I am a short queen okay I am not five nine like 110 pounds I was like oh, I'm a supermodel now okay <laughs> he had like everything wrong and and at the time I was just like this is embarrassing like I was like taking them down because I was like nobody <laughs> I, I'm more ashamed that like my parents don't know who I am <laughs> like and and now you know now I can like find the humor in that and like that's actually so funny it's like he was never gonna find me with that missing <laughs> I could have been standing right next to it in front of a police officer and they'd be like no no you know so I just think humor is just such a like it's really been my lifeline like I just want to laugh all the time and I not love. take anything seriously because life is really not that serious you know when you are like it, it just in the grand scheme compared to all the awful things that are happening in the world and it's like your problems just seem so stupid and you know it's really not that serious and it's also like a it's also like a way for women to see themselves as the protagonist in their own life like to watch you become the protagonist through the writing you know it's like we can only see what we see people being and I just think about like 10 years ago getting into the TV business it was like you know there has to be a rootable male protagonist mm -hmm. and then came girls and then came you know came you know broad city Your show, and which by the way was thank you fucking phenomenal thank you I'm like everyone needs to use the term mapa it's mapa the best yeah like it's, it's brilliant works for everybody and that like really stuck with me I was like this is a ge genius show oh, everyone should you. watch it but yeah, like now here we are 10 years later and like po in a post flea bag world and mm -hmm. like here you are, you know, um, really, you know, writing from a place of putting yourself really close to sexual danger and being yeah. able to emerge over and over again. I know, it's crazy. But that's why I like haven't had sex in two years. <laughs> yes. Like I never want to have sex again. I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, I feel like I heard you saying that you're not going to have sex with cis men anymore. I, I'm just not going to have sex, period. No, I, I just don't want cis men anywhere near me. Right. Straight men or cis men, like, they just cannot come near me. I swear, I just had an interaction <laughs> with one of them. And I was like, the whole time, I was like, something feels really weird. Like, <laughs> what's going on? And then I realized, like, oh, my God, I haven't been in the vicinity of a straight white man in so long. And, and he was... Flirt, he was, I wouldn't say flirting, it was sexual harassment to the stylist right. on the set, and I just, I couldn't believe what was happening, and it just really reaffirmed, like, oh, this is why we do not go near these, these people, right. you know, like, <laughs> like, okay, I'm remembering, yeah. like, this is why. Create, like, an egg, a safe space yes. of, a, of an egg space mm. around you where you're it's only safe people. Yeah. Okay, because yeah. I was talking about this with my, with my friend, cis men, even when they're not intentionally doing something, they do. Per they are perceiving you. Yeah. From their cis straight. And consuming you. And they're consuming you and just by showing of, up. And they kind of like lead with this notion that like you're there to please them. <sighs> and they get so mad at me when I'm like choosing. I know I look really cute tonight. But you guys know that I don't always look cute. And, and they like have like a visceral reaction to it to the point where they're like commenting and saying things to me like, she was so, oh, she's aging like milk. Or she used to be so hot and uncut gems. What happened? Like she's on cocaine. She's like just like anything. And it's like, no, I just don't feel the need to like be hot for you guys. And they like, because they're, they're the arbiters of pretty. Who are these people again? literal nobody yeah i'm trying to just figure out like they're nobody but in their mind like guys the on the internet of pretty and hot right. and they Fuck all of them. every last one i know it's just like oh it's exhausting you know yeah you're i'm living in a post that yeah world. post cis i call them cis males i call them chismales <laughs> it's a secret language like beware okay. the chismales i'm, t I'm using that and if you have to create a psychic egg because the chismales are coming in the room mm -hmm. So I offer that to you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you know when they're coming because they'll make it known they're here. And well, they're it, we are in a new whole revolution. Like when I say you're in the post flea bag world, like you're post me too. You're post these questions of like, what does consent mean? Are sex workers people too? Like we're past all that, mm -hmm. you know? 
and now you have your voice. You're a, best a New York Times bestselling author. I know. And an actor. I just want to say okay. that, like, I think it was 2015 or 2016. I remember, like, going through, I think I had just, like, moved back. Well, no, I followed my best friend, Harmony, RIP, to L.A. Mm -hmm. and was, like, <laughs> living on her couch and then she got a girlfriend and it was like obvious they didn't really want me there anymore and whatever so I, I like left and I came back to New York and and I was just so lost because I was coming back to a city that like I no longer felt safe in because prior to that I prior to that I had come out and like very publicly accused a man of abuse and everyone turned on me mm. and I felt like and I was like, he's from New Jersey. Like, you guys need to have my back. <laughs> like, I'm from New York. And whatever, it's fine. It's a whole other story. Patriarchy runs deep, it's huh? Across state crazy. lines. And, you know, I'd heard of that happening to women, but I was like, but that wouldn't happen to me. You know, you just are, you li you're living in this delusion, and then it fucking does happen to you, and then suddenly you're a feminist. You know, you, like, realize what it means, and that was a really eye-opening experience for me. And now I forgot where I was going with that story. No, it's you don't have to have a direction. That's my job. You can just want trail off. I, I, I wanted to tell you about two like big topics I want to talk to you about. One is mothering and one is fashion. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to take one on first? Mothering. Okay, well, I was a single mom with my first, I have a 26-year-old and a, oh. and a 14-year-old now, but really was much of the time doing it myself and watching you as a parent and just watching all of it, you know, I was watching his birthday party. I don't know why. I was obsessed. And I loved why? watching. I don't know. I was just obsessed. I couldn't, I was just obsessed with everything you were doing. I love that. And yeah, all of it, his birthday party at Lucian. I mean, all of it. I was just following you like I wanted a 24-hour channel. <laughs> Um, so tell me about, yeah, the vulnerability of like your mom's side with this other part of you being like an emerging author. And I know. I mean, I, it's, oh, it's like motherhood is so weird because it is so like rooted in like sexism in a weird way. And like, I feel like mothers in America just really get the, like we're in a class of our own, you know, and being a mom has just been such a humbling experience because I always say that my son is my anchor so that I don't float away because mm. he really is. And sometimes it's so whack because I'm like, oh, I want to go and like go, you know, go down the drain. <laughs> yeah. But he's there like bossing me around. Mm. And so it's, it is, it's very humbling in a way, but it's exactly what I needed in that moment. And he's the biggest blessing, the biggest headache. You what are his, know, like, I, how does I, he boss you? What does he say? Oh, God. <laughs> oh you have no idea. <laughs> He'll literally, like, make me sit and watch him perform, and, like, I can't clap. I can't, like, bob around to the music. I'll be like, no, phone down. <laughs> and then, like, just start, like, dancing. And, and he's, like, such a little dancer. He's such a performer. He's, like, really, like, me when I was little, but I just didn't have, like, the audience, except my next-door neighbors who, like, hated it. But, <laughs> but like, you know, I'm, I'm his biggest supporter, and I'm really blessed that I get to live with my chosen family, and, and we're all kind of, like, his parents, you mm -hmm. know? And we're kind of reconstructing what the family, modern family, kind of looks like. Do you, so. like, tell us all a little bit about, like, what your family unit looks like and how you guys care for one another? Yeah, I live with my best friend slash sister, Richie, and Richie's Here boyfriend, somewhere. Ben, and we have a beautiful home, and Valentino is the heart of our home, and when he's with his dad or with his baba, his grandma, it's like we like don't know what to do with ourselves. It feels like we're like in a shell of a home. He like is the life of our home. He's our mm -hmm. lifeline. So it's, it's really, it's beautiful. And it's kind of like, like my wildest dream. Mm -hmm. Like I, I feel like when I was young, I dreamed of, so oh, I remembered where I was going with that story. Okay, the great. Last story. <laughs> so when back. I came back to New York, <laughs> it was like 2016, sorry. <laughs> It was 2016 and I came back to the city that I no longer felt safe in and I didn't know who my friends were and I kind of looked at everybody like really just like, 
you know, like side eye, like you stayed friends with an abuser and chose them over me, or like you wanted to remain neutral. And it's like, if you're remaining neutral, you're choosing the side of the abuser, you know what I mean? And so I came back and I remember just like having a weird like seance in my bedroom, um, blood was involved. And <laughs> I like wrote down and made a list of like all my wildest dreams and things I hope to achieve. And one of them was to be on the New York Times bestseller <gasps> list. Yeah. Wow. I know. So wow. when it happened, it kind of reaffirmed the whole point of the book, which is that like you can make your wildest dreams come true and make them a reality, you know? And you just have to really want it and like really, really believe in it because that's all, all that power and that energy and that electricity and your mm. charge is what is gonna make it come to fruition. Can you relate with that a little bit too? Cause you've had so many things come to fruition, like major, it's, major It things. feels weird. It feels like life is being lived backwards. Like, yeah, yeah the, a strange psychic backwards It feels like circle. a cosmic, like the stars align and like, it, it, it's like yeah. almost, it's magic in a way. Yeah, when it happens, it is. I remember Diab Diablo Cody telling me that about Juno when she like had her moment, like that everything she had done before that had been a little bit of like push uphill, push uphill, and then suddenly something happens in your career and things just begin to lift and you can't push that time, you can't change that time. It's just like it happened when it was supposed to for you, yeah. you know? It's, it's really amazing. And, and I just hope that more people can like lead with that in, in their lives and like that your life really is like really what you perceive it to be. Mm. If you're always gonna focus on the negative, it's gonna be shit. And like I get so much hate all the time, but I also get so much love and I just choose to focus on that love because I feel like that is what's gonna like elevate me. Mm. And, but then don't get me wrong, I also have many, many days, months where I'm like, only focusing on the negative and I'm like oh you know and it's just like and it feeds itself I'll just spiral like darker 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 mm. and so I guess all I can say is just like do you guys know that like TikTok thing where it's like I'm the luckiest girl in the world the luckiest girl in the world like do it because it really fucking works mm. wait speaking yeah. of TikTok remember um I did it myself <laughs> How did that feel, watching that thing just become a thing? Okay, well, first of all, when that whole, like, my book is a masterpiece thing <laughs> happened, I actually hadn't written a word of it. <laughs> but I had to say that because <laughs> I knew my editors would be watching and I had told them that I'd started already. <laughs> so when I said that, I didn't think it'd go anywhere. <laughs> And then it did, and I was like, shit, like, no, I put the bar so fucking high. Like, why did I do that? But in a way, it was good, because it was like, it really kind of set the tone for what it, it needed to be. And, and so far, a lot of people have been saying it's a master. Yeah. So, it is. so maybe it was a good thing in the end. And then what about the, it was the eye makeup that. And I did it myself. <laughs> I did everything myself, though. I mean, <laughs> You did do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're just telling the truth. Yeah. <laughs> and I wrote the book myself, too. Amazing. No ghostwriter. Is that true? I, That's I, huge. Did they try to give you a ghostwriter? No. You were just like, I got this? Yeah. 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 You're like, let me do this. Uh-huh. I, I sent them, like, the first draft, and it was so bad. And I was hoping that they would just have a ghostwriter <laughs> on staff to go through it. And they were like, it's fine the way it is. And I was like, come on. No, so I like took it back and, and then edited it again. And yeah. yeah, no, actually they were so amazing. Like they didn't push me to write about anything I didn't want to. They yeah. didn't tell me to take anything out. Like it was actually such a great experience because I feel yeah. like I hear about so many like horror stories where publishers, editor, you know, every agents get involved and they're like, no, this needs to be more yeah. like this. Or can you talk more about that? Like, but they didn't do that to me at all, which is like, I guess what about like I, when I was writing my book like people were telling me stories of like they would be like an editor's assistant and they would be like oh yeah I had to go to Hunter S. Thompson's jacuzzi and beg him to write pages so I could bring them back like could you imagine if we had like the kind of male privilege where like assistants had to come to us in a jacuzzi and beg us to turn over pages mm, I just I feel like I would just get dropped like, right? Send us back our money. Like, we're competing like, against yeah. like these, we're trying to become legends in our own minds, but we're so 
you know, know. it still we're feels so compelled like, oh, by we're that self hatred. Yes. When like for them, it's like, of course they would be there, you know? Yeah. No, it's like the thing you said about like thinking that you suck. Like I still go through that all the time. Self hatred, yeah. like waking up in the middle of the night, like stop. Nobody likes you. Stop writing. You know, it never goes away. It's Why? like the hazard of a what job. Is that? It's like the is hazard just, of the job of being, being an artist. Is that being an artist or yeah. is that it's being an artist? Yeah. That's now it's like part of my process though. Like if I don't think it sucks, I feel like it's going to suck. Uh -huh. So I like have to like think how like that it's horrible and all these awful things about it and then I'm like in the back of my head I'm like it's going to be amazing. You know. Right, you have to like keep going back it's and really forth. It's really my process now. Yeah. It's like and also I'm like super I'm very superstitious. Yeah. So <laughs> it's just become like what what I do. That's my method. I feel like the book was really about like get being in your body. Like I felt like it was. You're so good at this. By the way. Shouldn't we have like a talk show? You should like, be like David a Susskind, maybe like Mort Saul. You're amazing at this. But it was. I, I was could like, do this with I, you forever. I know. We need our own show. We do. But my name I, isn't I, Jimmy. I you. you have to have. You have to have name. You have to be Jimmy to have a talk show in this Jim, country. Oh, you have to be a white man. You have to be a named white Jimmy. She's Smalle. Jimmy Kimmel. Jimmy Fallon. Oh my like, goddess! Oh. What's happening to the world? I can't even. Okay, I mean, we'll have so our own boring. talk show one day. Um, but yes, I, I was, I'm, so, I'm thinking about the body right now in my life and like the body, being like embodied. the physical body, like our bodies, you know. And, I, and your your book was so like I was thinking about like when you were a kid and your relationship with like Mia and your mother and the women in your lives and the girls in your lives. And I know you're just like I'm like, come on, be a lesbian. And you're like, <laughs> no, but. <laughs> There is this like love I, of I, women. I am a lesbian, though. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank God. I said this is coming out tonight. I, no, I'm. I'm more you love women. attracted to women, but then I'm also like emotionally attracted to women. But I've been so, like, socially ingrained to appeal to men because men have been like my my means to an end, my my source of survival, aka money. So I'm like so conditioned to be that way but like I know that deep down actually I, this this girl wrote on my Facebook for my birthday this girl I went to elementary school with and she wrote the funniest thing she was like I'll never forget in third grade when you did a cartwheel up to my table and said hi I'm Julia and I'm bisexual <laughs> <laughs> and I was like wait I did that in third grade but I, it's, I think I had, mo I was actually probably more in touch with who I was back then before I had to kind of rewire my brain so that I could survive, you know, mm -hmm. because it's easier to find a sugar daddy than a sugar mama, you know. Right. Or maybe not finding a sugar person at and all. Just making it on your own. But I didn't, I didn't have the self-esteem and I didn't have the tools uh, yeah. to see that as an option. I loved like reading about you as a dominatrix and like, and you say like you had all this love for women and this kind of like connection to all these women and female and female friends, but yet controlling men, it can just be so fun, right? Yeah. And so much money and so, and and yeah. Tell us, of, can you go ahead? Well, you want to hear about this? It's like I'm Phil Donna here. <laughs> tell us about controlling men, Julia. What did but it feel what like? What I will <laughs> say is that the, what's the the amazing thing about the dungeon and working in a place like that is that it's really, it really is the only place in the world where women rule. It's a matriarchal place and the men are subservient and are there to be used and treated like shit. Where everywhere else, it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. So I think seeing that at such a young age and I was so impressionable at 18 and it just, it changed everything for me. It was the biggest self-esteem boost I could mm -hmm. have ever had. And I recommend every girl do it because you need to reprogram your brain because that's the way it should be. Mm -hmm. Like women are graceful rulers. They'll, they'll rule over you, but they'll make sure your needs are met. You know, whereas I feel like a lot of the time men just take, take, take and kind of just think like they're entitled to it in a yeah. way, you know? Um, it's and divine women are work. More fair. Yeah, the sex, the work of a sex worker is divine mm -hmm. totally. emotional labor. Mm -hmm. Totally, and it was very. It was it was life changing. It was a pivotal moment for me. I definitely wouldn't be here if I didn't go through that. Did yeah. you feel like you like got in there emotionally with each with some of the men and like cared for their yeah souls sort oh, of for sure. I I still they still hit me up. 
like bad. Like, come care for my soul. To worship my feet. <laughs> well, yeah, no, they, <laughs> they want my feet. <laughs> but no, it definitely, it, it um, you know, you, you, you do form bonds with them. They're mm-hmm. so nice and they want to serve you. And they actually do believe that women are goddesses that are meant to be worshipped. And I feel like the most manliest men I ever met were in, was in the dungeon. Mm. Cause the they most would just take, Yeah, the most, because they would take, they would take the beating and they would take it all and just like, just like fawn all over you. And and to the point where I'd like get a little turned on, I'd be like, oh my God, I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, stop it, stop it, stop it. But like, cause they were just so, like it just felt so right in a way. And it felt like that's the way it like needs to be mm. or it should be. So beautiful. Yeah. Thanks for bringing us in there yeah. to the dungeon. You know, yeah. that's what I was like saying. It's like, I feel like I have so many books by sex workers. Like if anybody ever needs to start like, a library of books by sex workers because I've always felt like sex, sex workers are like our, our war reporters like going places with their bodies where everybody else can kind of read and and really think about it and dream about it and dream about what it means to sacrifice your body yeah. or offer your body but it's so impossible to talk about in culture like there are so few people who come out with that vulnerability of saying like I'm a sex worker or I was a sex worker and still go on to have a huge career in Hollywood mm-hmm. Um, it's a risk, you know, and that's what makes you such a heroine and what, what makes you such like a, you know, I can't wait to see what else you're going to do. Like, do you feel like directing movies or I would writing like more yeah. or what are your dreams? My What's friends like- all say I'd make a really great dictator and I think that they, <laughs> I think that they mean director <laughs> and yeah, I, I definitely, I, I do think I'd, I'd be pretty, pretty good at that. Yeah. Yeah. It's so easy. Mm-hmm. It's just like dolls. Is it easy? You, oh my God. I found that directing, like life is hard because people don't say what you want them to say or stand where, but directing, you tell everybody what to say and where to stand. And, and they then, just do it. Yeah, and then know, you do it again if they don't that, do it I'm right. Like, I'm tired of being the puppet. I want to be the puppet yes, master. Yes, yes. That would be amazing. But a graceful puppet master. master. <laughs> Fair, kind, you know, not like these men. Yes. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, <laughs> part of, it's part of filmmaking, I guess, patriarchy and even like the camera and the male gaze and yeah. what do you what do you think about the whole male gaze and the male gaze <laughs> no well, i was just that, i was just trying to make a which one i the I, G-A-Y-S. I no longer cater to the male gaze what about the g a y s but though? i do cater to the male gaze yes i knew there was a joke in there i knew it definitely <laughs> yeah definitely. we're all trying to find find the future this mm-hmm. like new world you know where but it's crazy because it's like I feel like we're kind of going backwards in a, in a weird way and I get like a lot of anxiety over that especially because my chosen family is queer trans and yeah you know not not conforming to what is you know yeah it's such a scary time we're going in and it, it it gives me a lot of anxiety yeah it's a scary time for women and anyone that's not a white man, pretty much. But I feel like the work you're doing by kind of like healing the divided feminine by being like, yeah, I'm a muse and I'm a subject, I'm an object, you know, and I'm a writer, you know, that you're both things that people can say like, yeah, she's a sex worker. And, you know, it's not like, I don't know, the old days used to be like, and then I gave it up or I committed suicide, <laughs> you know, for you to just like be, be proud. And to oh, be... I would go back in a day and like my, the man, my manager from like back in the day emailed me like I have a high roller client. <laughs> he wants to see you. I was like, yeah, one. like I'll do it. A thousand percent, $10,000. <laughs> Perfect. Right. I feel I like that's the it. reality show we want. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Like love is blind in a cell, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and yeah, a, sh- a shoe theme, a foot theme, golden shower theme, foxy and... feet. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, and so let's just talk about fashion really quick because besides the fact that you're a great writer and an actress, you are kind of inventing your own way of like being fashion. Mm-hmm. You're not even like in fashion. You're just fashion yeah <laughs> right I just read something where somebody was like yeah you're just fashion like you're I'm so not fashion that I'm fashion you're fashion right yeah. how are, like what is how do you become that 
I don't know. I just wear what I like, you know? And it's like most of the time I'm literally wearing boxers and like a dirty stained t-shirt for like three days in a row. So when I like dress up, I want to look cute. And yeah. and also I want to platform designers that I believe in. And, you know, most of the clothes I wear are just like independent designers. Remember like the Ralphs when your jeans were like really low? Yeah. <laughs> That was like a great moment. Like you were like, tell me about that day. You're like, I'm going to go to the Ralph's on Sunset. I'm going to wear my jeans really long and wear tape. No, I wore, wait, which one was that? I don't know. It was like right after. It was kind of the end. It was the transition out of, it was like you just kind of being on your own. You were no longer being like controlled by anybody. And then you went to the Ralph's. What happened was (laughs) that when I like came out and the clothes, like people were kind of just saying that it was very much like, the artist influencing my clothes and that he was like dressing me still. And I was like, no, these are like my outfits, you know? And also there was this narrative that like, he was the one bringing me everywhere, like to Schiaparelli in Paris or to dinner with Madonna. And it was like, no, 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 no. He was my plus one to both of those events. He really was. Like I let him into my world. I didn't go into his and like, he just kind of put eyeballs on it, but I was still doing those things. Right. So I think I just got really frustrated because I was like, no, 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 no. I worked really hard to get into to the place, in, in, to a place where I could do these things and I'm not going to let him take credit for it. So I think in that moment I was like, okay, I really need to keep the fashion up and I have to keep it going or they're all, they're just going to think that it was all him. Right. Wasn't, you know, and you did. So I kind of went on like a mission to like prove everyone wrong. And now Thankfully, no one really associates my clothes to him anymore. So yes. that has been a huge milestone for me. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's like you can be all the things, designer, yeah. model, your own muse. I'm You're almost like becoming your own muse. Yeah, I am my own muse. And honestly, like even the term muse, I just like find it a little bit like... Yeah, what was that? What happened? How'd that become your... It feels very like exploitative, you know, because I feel like in history, like muses have always been these kind of like faceless like blank canvases and like I don't think I am that I think anytime that I have been a muse um aside from when I was Josh Safdie's muse because I love him and I'll be his muse any day um you know it's usually like the man will be kind of projecting his fantasy onto you and then the moment that you're like, oh, no, like, I'm actually, like, this way. And then they're like, oh, I've lost interest. Mm-hmm. You should probably you know, go home now. Yeah, you should go pack <laughs> it up, go home. <laughs> so I don't know if I, like, love the term muse. But yeah. Like, like, I can't, like, shed it. It's, like, that's what people, you know, associate me with. And it, that's fine. Like, it's still a great, it's still a compliment. I inspire art. Okay, wonderful, you know. Yeah. But... But you're an artist. The art. You are the art, I'm yes. Art and artist. Yes. Um, I guess the, the th- thought maybe you might want to read a section from your... Oh, my God. A chapter, a moment. Okay. It's so beautiful. <laughs> it's princess. Okay. Take it away. <clears throat> On St. Patrick's Day, Leanna goes to a bar by herself and ends up meeting a bunch of Irishmen from Ireland who buy her drinks all day. As night falls, they invite her to get in their limo and go back to their hotel. I'm with Rick and three friends when she calls me and very bluntly demands that I bring drugs and girls to the W Hotel in Times Square. They have money, she whispers into the receiver. In a matter of minutes, we're in a taxi on our way there. I enter the huge suite and notice there's cocaine sprinkled on every surface, the TV, the radiator, the kitchen counter, even the toilet. There are rolled up $50 bills scattered all over the room. I go around pocketing them. The girls we came came with, Ash and Sarah, watch in amusement. Have you guys ever tried angel dust? I yell at one of the guys. No, what's that? He asks (laughs) as he takes a bump off his hand. It's a new designer drug. Everyone is doing it here. My friend has some. I point to Rick, who's been floating around the room with a dust blunt in his hand like a ghost in the shadows. The Irish guy's face lights up. I need to get some, I need to get some, I need some, I need some now, (laughs) he says maniacally, diving his hands in all his pockets. One bag is $60, I tell him. He pulls out a wad of cash and begins counting it. Five should be good, I say, as he sorts through the 
as he sorts through the fat stack of 20s. How much is that, he asks. 300, I say with a smile in my hand out. After the sale, I smile and lean into Rick, whispering through my clenched grin, that's six times what they actually cost, so you're giving me some for free. I hold out my shaky hand and he drops five bags into it. The Irish guy and I go into the bathroom and I roll up a dust blunt for him. He takes a few pulls and instantly enters another dimension. He's so high, he thinks he's in outer space. My tolerance is higher, so I roll up another one and then another one. The Irish guy's running low on coke and I'm starting to feel anxious. I keep hearing techno music in my ears, but I can't figure out where it's coming from. When I come out of the bathroom, I can't find Rick anywhere. I grab my cell phone and realize it's completely out of battery. I run from room to room, frantically calling his name. Did he say where he was going? I asked Sarah. I think he went to get more drugs, she says. I relax a little bit. The Irish guy follows me around, proclaiming his love for me over and over again. I'm starting to get repulsed by him as he wipes his runny nose on his hand. His skin is translucent, and I can clearly see his entire vascular network through his clothes. <laughs> I can barely understand him through his grinding jaw and thick Irish accent. We run out of coke, and Ash and Sarah get up to leave. Are you sure you don't want to come with us? Sarah asks. The sunrise peeks in through the curtains, and an uneasy feeling creeps into the room. I think I'm going to stay with Leanna, I say. I don't want to leave her. I don't want to leave her. But really, I don't want to leave the drugs. I walk them out and then get on my and then get on my hands and knees and scour the carpet for coke residue, mistakenly rubbing cigarette ashes on my gums. Hmm. I dig through all the ashtrays, trying to find any remnants of a dust blunt. I keep hearing the techno playing in my ears. I stand up and look around to no one. Who the fuck is playing techno? I hear Leanna in the bathroom having sex with one of the Irish guys. I'm starting to go restless. I'm starting to grow restless. The Irish guy who's obsessed with me won't stop talking to me, so I run into the bathroom to hide and turn on the hair dryer to muffle the sounds of Leanna's naked body clapping against his. My heart pounds and my stomach is cramping. Only Rick can fix this. I take Leanna's phone out of her purse and see that it's 6.30 in the morning. I pretend I didn't see that and go through her contacts, only to find that she has no numbers stored. I pop my SIM card out with an earring and put it in her phone. I have to see Rick. I call him on repeat until he answers. I went home, he says, stop calling me, my baby mama's coming over right now. I cut him off, speed talking. I just need to cop, you don't have to come back here, I'll come to you, I tell him. I run out of the suite with Leanna's phone and hop onto the train downtown. The techno in my ears is getting louder and louder. People's faces on the train morph into demons as they gawk at me in my barely there outfit, a black American apparel, bodysuit, and tight spandex pants. I get to Rick's apartment and his whole family is awake. His mom rolls her eyes at me when I walk past and but when I walk past her into the bedroom. I hear her stomping and yelling in Spanish, getting closer. Ma, relax, we're not doing nothing, Rick yells at her. She pounds on the door as Rick passes me a dust blunt. I take one pull and collapse backward onto the couch. The techno stops and an ocean of, bla of black floods my vision. I hear myself think, what is this? Oh my God, what is happening? And then a voice in my head tells me, Julia, you're dying. I desperately plead with myself to hold on tight and not let go, even though I feel warm and comfortable, not at all, even though I feel warm and comfortable, not at all high, but finally at peace. Suddenly, I'm transported to an ascending roller coaster ride of happier times flashing before my eyes. Starting at the bottom, I see my earliest memories. The reel moves fast, but I recognize the familiar feeling of being held by my grandpa. I see the tree we planted in the garden. I catch a glimpse of my brother on a bike going up the hill to our mountain house. As I approach the top of the roller coaster, I see myself where I am at that very moment in Rick's bedroom. It's like I floated up to the ceiling and I can vividly see a bunch of people crowding around me. I see Fruit Loops scattered all around in a puddle of milk. I see Rick's mom praying over me in Spanish. I see a pregnant girl going through my purse and pocketing Leanna's cell phone. I reach the top of the roller coaster. I clench my fist and prepare myself for the drop. But then a window appears before me in the distance. The rays, the rays of light spill into the pitch black space, illuminating a path for me to walk through. My eyes remain fixed on the window, which seems to be expanding. I'm, mem I'm, mesmerized. I'm mesmerized by it, but whatever consciousness I have left in me tells me to look away. I drop my gaze, and that's when I realize the light is now spilling in through the cracks of the wooden floor. It's so bright and so close that I can feel the heat on my face. I come to in an ambulance with vomit all around me. Even the paramedics are covered in vomit. 
one of them goes through my wallet frantically pulling out my fake IDs and holding them next to my face. Which one is you? He asks. I shake my head and pass out again. Thank you. Wow. So beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. You, I almost cried. <laughs> yeah, I did too. I love your writing and hearing you. Yeah, that was crazy. You found your way out of drugs. What year was that? 2007. I was 17. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's such an amazing journey, and I loved reading it. I loved every second of it. Before we, we're going to go to the audience for questions, but I just want to ask you, like, what books have you read throughout your life? Who, what authors have influenced you? Who, who's writing do you William like? William Burroughs, Avi. <laughs> um, I love Junkie. I loved um, A Million Little Pieces. Mm. I love like any book that's just like, so, oh my God, go ask Alice. That was like my favorite book in, mm. in elementary school. Um, just like any book that's like, dark and depraved and about drugs and violence and sex and that was my happy place. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to open it up to some questions. My question is for both of you. What, would, what advice would you give your 20-year-old selves? Do you want to go first? Sure. I mean, it's really that thing about the self-hatred, you know? I think at 20, I was probably, I think like at 16 and 17, I was probably okay creatively. But I think as soon as I began to really want to be seen by men, I was just, you know, lost in whatever, something other than writing. And a great writer friend of mine said, you know, like a coal miner, the hazard of the job is like what's happening, you know, in your lungs, an artist, the hazard of the job is the self-hatred. Mm -hmm. And that you have to expect the self-hatred to show up whenever you sit down to write. Like yeah. that person you didn't want to invite to the party and you did invite them and they show up early with a wheel of brie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and sit in the living room and you're not even ready. That's the self-hatred. Yeah. It's always there, especially if we live in patriarchy and white supremacy, and if we're not, you know, white or male. We're always going to think that our perspective is a problem. Can I ask you a question? Sure. When, what was it like? Because when you, you kind of transitioned when you were already in the industry. Mm -hmm. And what was the, like, what was the difference between how you were treated before to now? Did you like... It was more like how I treated myself. You know, I think I just wanted, up until let's say like maybe when Transparent, you know, happened, I just wanted to be like everybody's favorite girl. Yeah. And be like the most, you know, cool fun. Girl. Yeah, the cool girl in yeah. the writer's room. We're all gone girl. Right. Yeah. Yeah, just, yeah, there's patriarchy yeah. and you want to like operate within it and mm -hmm. that's just where I was. Ugh. Yeah. Ugh, but look, we're in a whole new world. Now we can yeah. look back Would at it. Would you say that you're happier now? Oh, my God. I mean, I can't even. Like, yeah. the whole... It's, the it's crazy. Oh, also, just, like, being non-binary and going back to all the times in which I behaved in these kinds of female mm -hmm. ways. You know, because every time you do that, you, like, chip away at yourself, you know? Yes. Every time you're, like, nice and polite and every sorry and every thank you and every, like... I think, you know, men don't say I think before they say something. Yes. You know what I mean? They just fucking say it. Yeah. And sometimes it's sometimes like, they go, let me tell you what. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they exactly. like a handle. They'll, they'll have a handle just to let uh, you know. Honestly, about we talk. need to take notes from them. <laughs> like, let me tell you what. You just bring the conversation to a yeah. halt. <laughs> and then, yeah. Instead of like, do you mind if I say something? Yeah, no, it's a whole, yeah. Ugh. Thank God that we're able to change. Yeah, what would you tell your 20 year old self? Oh, just not to like worry so much. I feel like I spent so much time either like dwelling on the past or like worried about the future and I never could enjoy the present because I was high. So I feel like I would just tell myself to just like enjoy it a little bit more. You know, the weight of the world is not on my shoulders. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be, it is what you make it, you know? So I think I would just let, let a lot of shit go because mm. 
you could be good, you could be bad, you could be anything, but life is still going to happen. So, you know, just be yourself. Mm-hmm. Be yourself. Yeah. I'm a clothing designer. I made my skirt. I want to know, how did you find yourself aesthetically? And can I give you a gift? Oh my God, I would love that. Thank you. You're so sweet. What's your name? My name is So Numb, like the Linkin Park song, I've Become So Numb. Oh, I love that. I also that. love to make you a skirt like this. Oh my God, I can't really see, but I see sparkles. And I love that. I love that. Um, wait, repeat the question. Um, how did you find yourself aesthetically? I'm very inspired by your specific aesthetic. You know, I think a lot of it is just like intuitive. Like, I just kind of like, whatever gets my like endorphins going and my like very numb and dead brain. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh yes, that, you know? And then it lasts for like a couple of months and then it's something else, I don't know. But usually like if everyone's going right, I wanna go left, you know? Just cause I feel like, unfortunately, a lot of people have like herd mentality. And I always want to just like show people that you don't have to be like everyone else. You don't ha even have to fit in. And actually it's almost better if you don't because then you'll attract your people. And if you're like masking all the time and like wanting to fit in, you're, you're never going to find your people. So just do the opposite of what everyone else is doing. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Julia and Mindy and... I just love you. Oh, I love um, you too. Thank you. I wanted to know, will you ever re-release your two art books, PTSD? I and knew you were going to ask that. I knew. How I, did I, I know? When I found out about you, I did the deep dive, and I was like, oh, yeah. Kanye's batshit, but he has great taste. <laughs> he does. He actually really. No, he has great taste, period. Period. Like, all and around. So we need many to give other him that. things, but yeah. in women specifically. Um, I, you know, I maybe, but like not until I'm like 60 or something. Yeah. I just feel like it's like been, been there, done that. It's old news. Like I want to top that, you know? And I feel like those books were really, um, for the people that got to see them, like I feel like they were very impactful and, and it, it meant something. Um, I actually don't even own a copy. They, yeah, they were all like stolen from me because you can sell them for like thousands of dollars on wow. eBay. Apparently, I found out. <laughs> so, um, yeah, maybe I'll re-release re so that I can have one too. <laughs> um, but I don't. Yeah, probably not for a while. But thank you for knowing about that because a lot of people don't know. Do you identify as an artist? Like, what when people? Yes before yeah. actress like, or artist, director God damn it. yeah yes you are an artist I'm yeah an artist. yeah nobody knows i've been trying to tell people but it's <laughs> i think everybody knows now you know i'm like so used to walking into a room and like knowing everyone's gonna like underestimate me um but i guess that's like my superpower that i already know that they're gonna underestimate mm -hmm. me so yeah and all you had to do was think things and they mm -hmm. came through they yeah. came true yeah i mean amazing it's crazy yeah Magic. I'm like, it, yeah. Okay, next question. Okay, next question. So I'm wondering, with Valentino, what would you do if he started to date a Gianna or was part Gianna? Oh my God. He act, we actually have this, um, I had this portrait, this oil painting done of a pic, like I had to send the artist a picture of Jonna and then a picture of Valentino and they're like together because I feel like she left my life at the same time he came in and, and he points to it and he goes, mama, mama. And I feel like maybe Jonna was like his mom at, in some other lifetime or something. But if he were to date a Jonna, um, I'd be thrilled. <laughs> I'd be thrilled. I would adopt her and hmm. I would love her and give her all the love that her mom couldn't give her. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Hi, Julia. Um, I wanted to ask how being bipolar has like influenced your artistry and your creativity, also coming from a bipolar girly. Well, it's interesting because I, <laughs> I know Kanye said this once, but like, Sometimes I feel like it's my superpower mm. because when I am in like a mania, I can like do anything, you know, but then the flip side is that then I'll be really, really down 
for a while. <laughs> and, um, but that's kind of my like time to recharge and gather more life experiences and just like I kind of make the best of it. And I'm not gonna lie, like ever since becoming a mom, like I'm not even on any mood stabilizers anymore. Like I had to get off when I got pregnant and I was so afraid because I was like, oh my God, what's gonna happen with the hormones and not being on my medicine and nothing happened. And so in a weird way, I feel like, I don't know if it was like corrected or, cause I definitely still, ha like now I have less manic episodes and more depressive episodes, whereas before it was more manic. So I don't know, it changed a little bit. Um, Cause I feel like I've kind of like gotten it a little bit more under control, but I don't know when I'm, when I just, if, if you are bipolar and you are in a mania, like just make art, create, like make the most of it. Cause you know, it goes away as fast as it came. But when like I, the most amazing artists and like composers are all bipolar. So that, that says something, you know, it's true. <laughs> so just like, don't just like make stupid choices and sh shop or do whatever, like, you know, all the things that mania people do, like actually like create and do something with it that then can like, you know, take you further into your life and kind of be a security blanket or something. Was it like when you were trying to get motivated to write, but you knew that you couldn't like lean on manic energy or lean on drugs or lean on any of the things. I was that like make waiting you. for that mania. Because yeah. How I, did you get your voice? How did you get going? I actually wrote an entire book in a manic spiral, like in 20, around the same time I like had the seance and like prayed to be on the bestseller list. And I, I like reread it to kind of get some inspo. And I was like, Oh no, 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 no. This is too crazy. I can't put this out there. Um, but it's really good. Um, Maybe it's your next book. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it was hard because I really like could, and I was kind of in a depressive episode too. Like I was kind of just like waiting for that like spark to come and it didn't. And then it got to the point where it was like, okay, I have to turn in my pages in three months and I haven't written a freaking word. How'd you do it? How did you get your... I had an amazing, my amazing, amazing bestie, Emma. She came over and she took out a, like a big calendar mm. and then we like marked all the days that my son was with his dad and those would be the days that I would work and then she came and mm. kept me company while I was working and then we were also making a leaf dress so she'd be doing the leaf dress and I'd be working at the computer and so I've, I'm really really lucky that I have a really good support network that like understands that I'm not normal and like will really help me yeah yeah and I like hate asking for help that's like a huge thing so a lot of my friends just kind of force the help on to me and then I be begrudgingly accept it nice. but I'm actually super grateful for it yeah yeah awesome mm -hmm. when you did the eye makeup and it started turning into like a thing because then Versace copied you right yeah like that was iconic and you were sitting with Donatella yeah and I was like wow like who is she? And then uh, I became obsessed ever since with like your looks and like everything. I love you. Thank you. You're and like, so how are you funny. able to overcome your like usage of like all the substances you would take and like get over that and like come to where you are today? I never got over it. Like um, I want to get high all the time, Dave, yeah. but I can't, you know, like I have to be a mom and like, and I don't want my son to go through what I went through, you know, and that's really it. But, but the real turning point where I was like, okay, I'm never getting high again was when um, my best friend, my soulmate, my just everything died from an overdose. That was like, okay, I'm never getting high again. Because if the tables were turned and like I died from an overdose and she still kept using, I would be like, what, what was it all for? You know, like what, you know what I mean? So it was like kind of not to let her death like just like be in vain and and kind of it was like the only thing I could do in that moment and I've had so many friends die but that that was like my like other half so I just couldn't and I have not gotten high since yeah, yeah. it's 
sucks that like that's what it took to get me sober but in a way it's like you know maybe it's a blessing because I'm here now so yeah what about what you're what are you thinking about like over the next 10 years what are your new dreams I would love to just like fade into obscurity <laughs> <laughs> actually you want to fade into obscurity like yeah. right now after this and let the art speak for itself, mm. you know, like write movies, write TV shows, have more art shows, more books, children's books, like just make more art and not have to be so like front facing, mm -hmm. you know, but if that's what the world needs and wants, then I absolutely will make that sacrifice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you're gonna like become like Jane Fonda, like looking back on her Barbarella days. Aww. Like that you're gonna be an, you know a director and a writer and a you know leader and just a queer icon really to be making queer family to be in a relationship with Richie. You know, as I said, I was obsessed and I still am. Yeah. You know, I just I love who you are for our culture and I'm I'm Aww. so glad you're writing. Thank Let me ask you one more question. Down the drain mm -hmm. is kind of like going down but like your whole vibe is like going up and like reaching I think you have to go down to go up you know I feel like some like it's even in AA they have this thing where it's like let them hit rock bottom let them it's almost like encouraged and it's like because you really can only go up from there and sometimes you like have to get that low to like really like be so desperate and like so broken that like you like and that's when and that's when the miracle happens you know that's when you just kind of let go and let god in and by god i mean like the karmic universal force that ties us all together you know i don't mean like you know that god like yeah. this god like this is god you yeah. know like so you know sometimes you just have to Totally. Yeah, no, it's, um, we're all just barely holding on one day at a time. This one world is so nutty. Sometimes one minute at a one time. One minute at a time, yeah. yeah. Do you, like, have a sponsor? Do you have, like, a sponsee? Do you Babe, sponsor no, people? I'm drunk right now. <laughs> what are you talking about? It's all made up. It's all made up. Julia, I love you, fellow 90s baby and single mommy. My baby's right there, so. <laughs> my daughter I was wondering me. who this baby so belonged to. Hi. But um, so I just relate so much to you because our lives kind of parallel. I'm from Los Angeles, born and raised, and you're from New York, and I know that these worlds um, in L.A. and New York are very crazy, and growing up there, um, you grew up really fast, and you've had such a presence on social media, like both like Instagram and then TikTok, giving your um, bathtub advice and apartment tours, but I've noticed you've gone a little bit quiet, and I was wondering if it's because of the hate or if it's just because it's no longer your thing but I miss you on there <laughs> I you know it's like it's weird I go I just go through phases like I'll get really into something and then like lose interest overnight and like I don't know if it's because I'm a bipolar girly but <laughs> it's like I've just always been like that you know and it's also like I'm sure I'll like get into doing it again you know but it was like Sometimes I sometimes I, I get these cues from the universe and I'm very like always like waiting for signs, looking for signs and like I believe in that stuff. I do believe that like God speaks to you through other people and like sometimes I just feel like just shut up and listen, you know, like there's other people that need to speak right now and like, it, you know what I'm saying? And then when it's my turn, I'll know when it's my turn. But I think knowing when to just a bit and let other people you know what I mean not to like clog the feed and like also if I don't feel like I have anything really poignant to say like I, I don't want to just because I feel like a lot of creators sometimes just like talk for the sake of talking and sometimes it's like okay you really didn't have to make this video you know <laughs> like I love you but like come on like and I don't I don't want to be like that so yeah just like listening to the cues, I guess. Mm. Well, I want to thank you for writing this amazing book and bringing us down to your rock bottom and out again. And I'm just so excited to watch your career take off and hopefully we can collaborate one day on something. We're going to. Yes, we're going we're to make something. We're manifesting that right now. We're manifesting it. Yes, yeah, so I can't wait. Our own show. Let's make it happen.
a bag. Yay, you're so amazing, and thank you so much for being oh God, an icon and being here. And yeah, it's so fun. I can't even believe, dude, I can't even believe they agreed to do that. I can't. I mean. When I heard they were going to do it, I was like, I was wait, like, really? I changed like, my plane ticket. I'm going to the airport. I would, I mean, I, this is like a total dream come true. So, no, and, I, and I know that everybody here but knows But you manifested this. Yes, that's right. I was trying to find you. Really you really did. We were already trying to find each other. That's crazy. Months ago. But yeah, I can't, I'm, I'm sure you guys are all bringing the book home tonight. I can't wait for you to get it. And read it. It's like read. It's like cuddling up with like a letter from your best friend, you know, that you just can't put down. And you'll just read it all the way. You know, you'll stay up all night and you'll just be in there with Julia and her journey. And I'm, thank you for letting me interview you. And thank you, Alex, for coming.